The King James Bible Research Council collects some bigger names and includes some gifted guys. They are an excellent representative of mainstream IFB, Independent Fundamental Baptist, King James Onlyism. And they just had their most recent annual conference. I've tried to listen to or skim most of their addresses over the years at these conferences. In this conference, they gave more attention than I've ever seen to the readability of the King James. Most addresses were still related to textual criticism, as usual, an issue I prefer not to discuss at this time. So I will set that issue aside. These brothers, it appears, have started listening a little bit to my work on King James readability, and they are a good harbinger of the kinds of counter-arguments I think we'll continue to hear for a long, long time. Paul tells Timothy to correct his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. I've puzzled over this passage because there are points at which it appears Paul is talking about opponents within the church, and there are points in this little passage at which it seems like he's talking about non-Christians. But either way, patiently enduring evil and correcting opponents with gentleness are commanded. So I'm going to do that, even when, as you'll see, one of these brothers, and I do regard them all as brothers, kind of goes after me personally. But I'm going to end up with some good news, some surprising admissions about King James readability from these dedicated defenders of the King James. Let's jump right in. I honestly forget the name of this speaker on the screen here. I will know some and not others, and for that I apologize. I want their ideas and not their identities to be the focus anyway. A second Dr. Zeiner about this conference and some of the issues which uh, you are hearing us deal with these two days. And um, he was telling me some, some things about how the enemies of the KJBRC paint us with a broad brush. Um, sometimes they try to uh, lump us in with, with those of, of uh, Peter Ruckman, uh, Gail Ripplinger, and uh, so on. If you've not, go watch Gary Mann's, uh, Dr. Gary Mann's message on why translations are not inspired from seven years ago. It is well worth your time. So we see. Okay, I want to express agreement here first off, even though this technically wasn't about readability. This group does sincerely wish to reject Ruckmanism. They just as frequently invite it in, that is Ruckmanism, without, I believe, realizing it, because as you'll see, they commonly call the King James perfect. But being unwitting occasional adopters of Ruckmanite ideas is much better than being self-conscious, all-in promoters of those ideas. Let's keep going here. Let me get this playing again. The people that turn from the King James Bible because they don't like what it says, and since the times are changing, they want their Bible to change as well. But okay, we're getting right into it. Uh, this is about readability because I am saying I want the King James to be replaced in pulpits. I don't plan to replace it in my own study, or certainly I'm not going to go into anybody else's study and, and lift it out. But for institutional use, I think the King James has gotten to the point where it's no longer sufficiently intelligible to meet the standard of 1 Corinthians 14, edification requires intelligibility. So yes, in, in a sense, he's accurately representing me. But then he goes right to my motives. He says that I want a revision or update of the King James, you know, based on whatever Hebrew and Greek text someone prefers. That's what I say next. He says, I want that because I don't like what the King James says, and I want the Bible to change to fit my preferences. No, this is not true. Let me instruct those who are in opposition. I do not want the Bible to change. I want me to change. I want to change in response to God's word. I did that with the King James for many years, respond to God's word, but I can't do that quite as well if I don't understand some of the words because of language change. That's why I want the KJV to be revised. Uh, revised. Let's uh, keep going. Dr. Ziner said something in a text that caught my attention, and I asked his permission to use it today. I'm going to go bra grab my King James Bible while you continue to listen to this. Here's what Dr. Ziner said in regards to our newfound enemies for the King James Bible. Dr. Ziner said, I really don't think that most of them even care. The Bible translation is not an issue to them. What is an issue to them is money, prestige, fame, growth, and acceptability. 
What an indictment. I sat and looked at my phone for a period of time. He texted me on a Sunday afternoon, and I stared at it and thought about it and thought about it, and he is 100% correct. What is an issue to them is money, prestige, fame, growth, and acceptability. And, and I... Okay, let's get right into this. I wouldn't necessarily prefer to start with these kinds of ad hominem uh, arguments, but I think I'm following the order of the conference. It's a long story. It actually was a lot of work putting these videos together and pulling out all these clips. You know, maybe I'm not following the order. I, I can't remember. This just kind of happened to fall into my timeline first, so I'm dealing with it first. And here's my response. I'd be lying if I said there was nothing in my heart that reached out for money, prestige, fame, growth, and acceptability. All of those things are ever-present temptations. Watch my channel, read my book, authorized, read the responses I give to commenters, take a small guess at the hours and resources it takes to make these videos. It's 10.20 p.m. right now. I'm preaching tomorrow morning. Watch my face and you decide if I'm in it for the money and fame. I won't defend myself. I will say, however, that this is the very definition of ad hominem argumentation, and I'm not going to engage in it the other way. I'm going to turn the other cheek. I will not say that the members of the King James Bible Research Council or Council are all doing their work out of a desire to get to speak at conferences or sell books. I don't believe that. I assume they're sincerely wrong, that they're taking their viewpoints because of human finiteness and not human fallenness. Actually, this kind of direct ad hominem did not, I would say, characterize the whole conference, at least not this year. Mostly, the speakers were more careful than this. Let's move on now to the next speaker who mentioned King James readability. This is uh, Phil Stringer. I've got to tell you, as I've watched this for the last 20 years, there's some things about this that are absolutely amazing to me. One of the things that's absolutely amazing is every time it happens, I hear the same story. Okay, he's talking about people who move away from the King James. He's actually responding to my friend Brian Sams. He hears the same story from them every time they move. I mean, it's just amazing. Guys will say, you know, they, they took a church with every intention of honoring and keeping the church's King James position. But then they found out their children could not understand the King James Bible, and so they felt obligated to change for the sake of their children. A couple of things have bothered me about that. Number one, all these folks were saved in King James churches, raised and trained in King James churches, and they understood it. Why can't their children understand it? So that's what bothered me. Second thing that has bothered me, I'm a bus kid. I've made the statement many times in public, sometimes to appreciation and sometimes to rebuke. He's a bus kid. He was from a non-Christian family and was brought to, to church on the bus. I've said seminary professors have trouble understanding the King James Bible. Bus kids don't. I was Now, I actually really like this guy, Phil Stringer. I've watched a number of his addresses, or listened, I should say, over the years at the KJBRC annual conference. He's avuncular. He just strikes me as a guy I could have a real conversation with. He's a nice guy. But I have to point out something that he does that I hear over and over again from King James defenders. He talks in absolute terms about readability. Either you can understand the King James Version or you can't. Those are the options. There's no room for the more careful case that I make, namely that most people with high school educations can understand most of the King James pretty well, but there are enough individual difficulties due to specific archaisms that it's time for revision. He says that seminary professors have trouble understanding the King James Bible, bus kids don't. I'm a seminary professor. The argument he's making here is that people like my friend and fellow BJU graduate, Brian Sams, used to be able to understand the King James. And like me, I was in a King James only church. How come it's impossible for us all of a sudden? But we're not saying it's impossible for us to read the King James. It's possible. Mostly, and for most people, it's possible to do pretty well, even very well, if you grow up with it like I did and put time into it like I did. But it's not possible, in my judgment, to understand all the dead words without looking them up. And it's certainly not possible to understand all the false friends without someone teaching them to you, or at least teaching you how to find and verify them. 
which is work that King James defenders, such as those on this council, don't seem to see as necessary because they don't do it. If Brother Stringer gets the same story all the time, at what point will he actually think to himself, you know, if this many readers are complaining that it's hard to understand the King James, maybe it is indeed unnecessarily difficult because of archaic language. Computers are not the best judge of readability. Readers are. Let's keep going now. Years old. There was not a Bible in our home. I attended church for the first time. Mom had been out of church for years. My father literally had never attended a single church service in his life. I got, got to church, got saved, started going to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek service, everything they had. They gave me a King James Bible. I started having daily devotions when I was 10. There were a lot of things I did not understand. I, at times I asked questions, but it didn't bother me. There were things I didn't understand. That's what I went to church for. That's what I was expecting. The thought that there was a problem with the Bible never crossed my mind. And as time has gone on, I've heard this over and over again, while you, you know, people just can't understand the King James Bible today, but I've been preaching for 51 years. This has not been my experience. I was a bus kid growing up. I've worked with tons of bus kids. I've never had a single bus kid tell me there was a problem with them understanding the Bible, at least not before they went to Bible college. Most recently... Okay, this is an argument that I hear all the time from King James defenders, uh, that the Bible should be hard to understand. We should expect it. They don't observe any difference, however, between words or passages that are difficult to understand because of the intrinsic difficulty of the concepts, like the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 to 25, a passage I still struggle to understand, uh, things like that, and places that are difficult to understand because English has changed over time. They don't make a distinction. My problem with exclusive use of the King James is not that God inspired some things in Scripture to be hard to be understood. My problem is that language change makes it so that exclusive King James use throws up unnecessary difficulties beyond and above the things that God already made difficult. We pastored in inner city Chicago. Okay, actually, I got to say a little something else here. I worked with bus kids too. And I cannot say that I personally have had the experience of a bus kid complaining about the King James. That was just too long ago. I can say that I repeatedly asked the bus kids questions over many years to see if they were understanding what we were having them memorize. And I repeatedly found out that they did not understand very well. Now, this was mostly with the New American Standard Bible. That was the Bible that we used in that weekly bus ministry that I was in for six years. On the one hand, I'm here acknowledging that shifting to a modern translation will not make the whole Bible instantly understandable to anybody, let alone an unsaved bus kid. That was mostly what I was dealing with. But what long experience teaching bus kids led me to believe is that the bus kids don't complain about the readability of the translation that they're handed because they're not memorizing in order to understand. They never showed me much evidence over many years that they cared if they understood or not. I'm really sorry to say that. It's actually a very sobering truth for me because I invested a lot of years in this ministry. And they don't therefore realize, these bus kids, that they're misunderstanding. It's just syllables to them most often. In many years working with bus kids, literally hundreds of them, Bible Club, bus, you know, VBS, I can't remember a single time they ever asked me any questions about Bible verses or difficult words. They just repeated the syllables that they heard, and they seemed to be annoyed to be asked about the meaning of these words. So the fact that they never inquire about that meaning should not be taken as testimony that they understood the King James just fine. I have to wonder, do these brothers at the King James Bible Research Council ever ask the bus kids to explain the memory verses that they've just recited? Let's keep going now. For about six weeks and... Uh, they asked if they could talk with me, and they said, Pastor, we really like you, and we appreciate you, but we, we just cannot stay in this church. I said, why is that? And they said, you use the King James Bible. I said, we have a 10-year-old daughter, and we know she won't be able to understand it. We were sitting in their living room. And their daughter immediately spoke up and said, but Dad, I've learned more about the Bible in the last six weeks 
than in the three years we spent at the last church. They didn't use people that you're... So I don't deny at all that some gifted Bible teachers preach from the King James Version. My main mentor did for many years, the series through Ephesians that really changed my life that he preached was all in the King James, and it was fantastic. Give me any day an excellent preacher who preaches from the King James over a poor one who preaches from the ESV or NASB or NIV, but those aren't the only two options. How about an excellent preacher who preaches from a translation that's made into my English? Dealing with, without Christian background, don't have trouble with this. But pastor's kids who grew up in Christian schools and homeschooled in church have trouble with it. And we would, we would have, we're blessed to see a lot of people saved in church in Chicago, and we had this come up over and over again. Never one time did one of these people get saved in non-Christian background ever tell me they were having trouble understanding the King James Bible. But always somebody from a church they were not saved at would tell them, you shouldn't go to that church because they use the King James Bible and you'll never be able to understand it. Until somebody told them that, it never came up. And I finally figured out why seminary professors have trouble with the King James Bible. Why preacher's kids have trouble with the King James Bible and bus kids don't. We didn't have anybody to tell us that we couldn't understand it. Of course, they emphasize. You know, that last line was delivered as a laugh line, and he got some laughs. But, you know, that's actually the case I'm trying to make. This is the situation that I would predict as a philologist. It's the situation I experienced as a King James reader. People who don't read other translations will stumble many times over archaic King James wording, without realizing that they are stumbling. They won't know that they're actually misunderstanding. That's what a false friend is. Most of my false friends were words I myself read right past without realizing that I was misunderstanding them. It's new, new, new. This is new. This is new. That was old. People can't understand what was old. You understand the first book written advocating the replacement of the King James Bible because it was archaic was written in the 1700s. It's not in print, of course, anymore. People have been saying that about the King James Bible for literally hundreds of years. Oh, but it's new. So this is true. Ben Franklin and Noah Webster, especially the latter, I have a great video, I think it's great, I loved it, on Noah Webster. They made almost exactly the same complaints about the archaisms in King James English that I make. Were they all making this stuff up? When does this argument that Brother Stringer makes, you know, people have been making these complaints for years, when does his argument become an argument against his position rather than for it? These brothers really do talk as if only malign motives could cause someone to complain about archaisms in King James English. What if I sincerely want to understand God's word and I sincerely want others to understand it? What if that is what is driving me? it's new we want them to have something that's new when did new become a qualification for ancient words oh but we want it to read like the daily newspaper do you really seriously uh as dr brown has okay this is getting into the next speaker brother ramirez um on Brother Stringer here, he's mixing up different categories. Yes, I actually do want the English of the King James to bear some very distinct similarities to the language of the daily newspaper. If all daily newspapers out there say broom, and not a single one says besom, then our English Bible in Isaiah, what is it, 1 or Isaiah 14, should say broom and not besom. If no reporters alive ever use the words so that to mean if only, see 1 Kings 8.25 in your King James, then our Bible translation shouldn't do it either. But of course, the content of the daily newspaper is a mixture of serious stuff and frothy stuff, you know, from wars around the world to pop culture news on Britney Spears. I do indeed expect the Bible to have generally more serious content than frothy stuff. Yes, the Hebrew and Greek words of the Bible are ancient, but no missionary to Indonesia would translate the Bible into ancient Indonesian, 
And if there were such a thing as ancient English, there really isn't, we shouldn't translate the Bible into that either. We should use, as much as possible, words that people can understand today. As we'll see later in this response video, it's not always possible. The Bible talks about some obscure people, places, and things. Now, we do turn to Brother Manny Ramirez, I think I got his name right, who actually has more of substance to say about King James readability than anybody else at the conference, even more than the brother whose job it was to address that subject, Dan Hayfley. Ramirez makes a ton of claims in rapid-fire fashion. We're going to slow way down and patiently evaluate those claims. As already mentioned, I'm going to be speaking on the subject of why our church will not transition from the King James Version. This is going to be a response to a, a podcast, okay? Uh, he became the pastor of the church he's pastoring now down in Jacksonville, Florida, back in 2016. It was a five-year process, and in January of 2021 is when he used a different... He's talking about Brian Sams now. ...Bible version for the first time from the pulpit, which was the New King James, which just confirms what we've always knew, uh, what we've always known about the new, the new King James Version is that the New King James Version was supposed to be uh, an easier uh, to read version of the King James Version, but all it has ever really become is just another gateway or a bridge to, for folks to transition, as they're promoting now, to more corrupt versions of the Bible. Number two. So Brother Ramirez, right out of the gate, is making another kind of ad hominem argument. You know, people say they're turning to the New King James out of a desire to have a more readable translation, but what they're actually doing is using it as an excuse to turn to corrupt Bibles. This is what Brian Sams is really doing. What nobody says clearly in this entire conference, not that I heard, and I did listen to every address, though I admit I skimmed just a few when it seemed like they weren't talking about readability at all. What none of them says clearly is that the New King James Version is based on the same Hebrew and Greek texts as the King James Version. What no one mentions at all is the Modern English Version, which did the same thing and made a more clear effort than the New King James to stick with the translation decisions of the King James translators. Their claims of a lack of readability in the King James Version is an exaggerated, overrated, and invalid argument. And they almost don't speak at all. Okay, okay, exaggerated, uh, invalidated. Let's get into it. Here we go. We're now going to get some treatment of readability. When it comes to differences between the received text and the critical text, they hardly bring that up. All their argument is always about readability, readability. And we'll say something concerning that. But I suspect that one of the reasons why they will not deal with the real issue at hand, which is the underlying text, is because their position on that matter is weak because they know that that's a battleground they don't want to fight because that's a fight they'll lose every time, okay? But I, want to, I want to be real straightforward here. Text is a battleground I don't want to fight on, not because my position is weak, but because after many, many attempts to talk about New Testament textual criticism with King James onlyists who could not read Greek, I finally saw the folly in this. I also don't want to fight over text because I sincerely believe that the Texas Receptus is a good option. I don't think the differences between their particular edition of the Texas Receptus that I've got two of on my shelf and my preferred Greek New Testament, I don't think those differences are worth fighting over. I also don't think the Bible tells us which Greek New Testament to use. So I am fine with them using the Texas Receptus or any edition of it. I just want them to make or use a readable translation of that TR. But I observe something. I've never met a King James defender who can talk only about readability. They always, always stray over into talking about textual criticism, even when they say they're not going to, even when their stated topic is readability. They also, in my experience, nearly always include one overt falsehood in their comments about text. The only overt falsehood I'm going to address, because I don't want to argue about text. Here's that falsehood. Can you catch it? That's the real issue. Okay, they want to they want to change the whole argument to readability. It's all about readability. No, uh, we're not saying that readability is not an argument at all. We'll deal with it. But the main issue, what's even more important than readability, is accuracy. Okay, keep keep listening for the overt falsehood. We're not quite there yet. What's even more important is purity. 
This is okay. And so in regard to the, the critical text, the critical text that underlies all the modern translations. Did you catch it? It is simply and clearly false that the critical text underlies all the modern translations. I would give Brother Ramirez a pass on this if he or others clearly said the opposite elsewhere in this conference. We all make slips of the tongue at times. I still won't even say that he's purposefully lying here. I don't think he is. But he is telling a direct, clear, and significant untruth. One that I have heard repeated over and over from Del Johnson in those Leaven of Fundamentalism videos right through the speakers at this conference. The critical text does not underlie all modern translations. The big exceptions are the New King James Version and the Modern English Version. I think this untruth gets perpetuated because it seems to make the whole debate simple. Pick the one Bible that's based on the right text, the King James. Del Johnson famously had a whole stack of Bibles on a coffee table next to his pulpit at Pensacola and only one Bible on the other. He said that all the Bibles on the one side came from a corrupt source and the King James was the only one that is from the pure source. He pointed to the other coffee table. He had one Bible on it, the King James. I wish I could go back in time and stand up and shout, what about the new King James? I wish I could do the same to Brother Ramirez, so I guess I'm doing it now via YouTube as best I can. Why did he say this? Why did he speak this untruth? If you know the issues, you can pick up that Ramirez does seem to know that the New King James is based on the TR, but he doesn't say so. He says the opposite, and he goes on the attack against the New King James big time, and I'm going to do my best now to patiently answer his claims. These are the works of apostates. There's a problem. Okay, now Brian Sam says that the day that he publicly transitioned his church from the King James Version, he started using the New King James from the pulpit. I wish I had the time uh, to do a whole treatment on just the New King James Bible alone, but I'll have to save that uh, for another time. Okay, but he recommended these other translations. And again, I want to make the point that the New King James is being used by these transitioners as a gateway to encourage their people to use something else. But the problem with the New King James, it is, brethren, the New King James is a watered-down version of the King James Bible. For example... Okay, he's going to give examples. He's going to rattle them off. We're going to go through them patiently. Listen. In the New King James, the word Lord is omitted 66 times. That's a lot of times to omit a very important word like Lord. Uh, the word God is omitted 51 times in the New King James. The word heaven is omitted 50 times. The word repent, is that an important word? It's omitted 44 times. The word hell is omitted 22 times. The word Jehovah, is that important? It's omitted entirely from the New King James. The word damnation is omitted entirely from the New King James. Okay, the claims come so thick and fast. They come with no context, no explanation but with a clear, cynical narrative that goes something like this. Once upon a time, the King James was perfectly fine until somebody decided to use a few old words as an excuse to change and weaken the Bible and make money off of it. That's what you hear consistently from these brothers. I expected some of Brother Ramirez's claims here to have some weight to them, nonetheless, but I looked them all up during family TV time, if you must know, and they are misleading at best. He says that Lord is omitted 66 times in the New King James. First off, he's assuming in every one of these examples that the King James is the standard. He does this again with all these points. Second, he fails to know that there are passages where the New King James uses Lord and the King James does not. Genesis 6-5 is an example. You can look at that for yourself. Third, one of these instances that he adduces is in 2 Chronicles 17.4, in which the Lord is actually in italics in the King James because it was brought in from the Greek Septuagint and does not appear in the Hebrew. That's why the New King James didn't include it, as best I can tell. Fourth, the vast majority of these instances that he talks about are actually the lowercase word Lord, like master, for which the New King James often uses the word master instead like in the passage in which Jesus speaks of a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household. The King James uses Lord there. I don't know where Brother Ramirez got his statistics, but this is terribly misleading. He also says that God is omitted 51 times. What he doesn't explain is that a full 23 of those times are because of the phrase God forbid which is not a truly literal translation of the Greek and Hebrew. It's actually in both Testaments. Five of those times are in the phrase, God save the king, 
which is also not a literal translation of the Hebrew. As the marginal notes in the King James itself show, it's literally long live the king, which is just what the new King James says. So if you think about it, God forbid, the word God does not appear in the Hebrew or Greek. And so the new King James is doing what these brothers usually say is good and going more literal. A number of the other times that the new King James quote unquote omits the word God as compared to the King James are in interpretive renderings like would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. But there again, Actually, the word God does not occur in the Hebrew. I'm not actually saying that the King James translators made a bad translation, uh, but technically the new King James didn't omit the word God. The King James added it. Do you want me to go on? I could, I swear I could. The new King James does not remove the word God. He also says that heaven is omitted 50 times. I'm just at a loss as to where he's getting this. It's just not true. And even where the New King James does go with a word other than heaven in places where the King James has heaven, it's often because the passage at hand is talking about the sky, like in the phrase, the fowls of heaven. The New King James uses the fowl of the air, which is totally accurate, just fine. Because we're not talking about heaven, God's abode, we're talking about the sky. Ramirez leaves the distinct impression that the New King James is trying to mess with the doctrine of heaven. This is a very significant distortion of the truth. I'm assuming again that Brother Ramirez was not being purposefully malicious here, but was just repeating something that he read in more extremist pro-King James literature. Repent is omitted 44 times, he says, in the New King James. It's actually pretty easy in Logos to see the places where the King James has repent and the New King James has something different. What's not so easy is talking through all the many reasons why in various passages the New King James translators did what they did. And I'm just not going to try your patience like that. I myself will have to generalize. But I will give more detail than Brother Ramirez did. <laughs> This again appears to be something that Brother Ramirez didn't actually look at for himself because the majority of the times where the New King James chose not to use the word repent all had to do with times when the King James says that the Lord himself repented. For example, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. That's Exodus 32:14. In this passage, the New King James uses a word that it frequently uses, uses instead of repent, whenever it's God who's doing this action. The New King James reads, so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Brother Ramirez leaves the impression that the New King James is trying to alter or even remove the doctrine of repentance. Actually, they were trying to make certain that they didn't suggest that God sinned. Okay, another one. Hell is omitted, he says, 22 times. Now, I've talked about this in some more detail in my video on Albert Hem's attack on the New King James, Hemmed from the Trinitarian Bible Society. You can go look at that. I'll just observe that the New King James preferred translation of the Greek word Hades is Hades, and this is a reasonable choice. So was hell, but the New King James is not omitting the doctrine of hell. They're trying to communicate accurately what the Spirit inspired. This one is complex. I urge you to go to that other video. Jehovah, let's talk about that one. It's completely gone, he says. This is a word that appears only seven times in the King James. I did a video on this for Logos, and I won't say that Jehovah was an error or mistake in the King James, but it is itself a tiny bit of a complicated misunderstanding of the Hebrew. In each case, in the New King James, it is utterly clear who the New King James is referring to. They're not taking God out of these passages. They're just not using the odd and disputed word Jehovah to do it. I'm getting weary of ex explaining these complex matters, to be frank. This one is complex enough that I just have to refer you again to my other video. I'll try to remember to put a link in the show notes. Let's go to damnation. That one's gone too, he says. This word occurs 11 times in the King James. In eight of those passages, the New King James uses the word condemnation, which is exactly what damnation meant in 1611 and exactly what the Greek says. In three other places, they use judgment, which in context means the same thing as condemnation. There's just nothing to complain about here. I just can't imagine that Brother Ramirez actually looked up all these passages himself and carefully compared them with the Hebrew and Greek. Again, it sure seems to me that he read these things somewhere and thought these arguments sounded good, so he repeated them.
okay? But their biggest argument, now here's their biggest argument uh, for why they, the churches need to transition from the King James to a more modern version. It's because of what they call a lack of readability. But I'm here to tell you, brethren, this argument is very exaggerated, very overrated, and even flawed. As a matter of fact, I find it interesting what this author says here, quote, isn't it ironic that with the proliferation of all the modern language versions that are supposed to make the Bible more understandable and, and are supposed to increase readership, that there is such a neglect of serious Bible reading and study that, and, and that there is such a profound theological ignorance in the average evangelical Christian as we see today. So we have over 200 versions of the Bible in English. Are people reading the Bible more than ever before? Are people learning more about the Bible than, better, uh, than ever before? Okay. Uh, at the 920 mark of the podcast, The Translation Transition, Sam's explains a special moment when he was helping his son to do a, with a homework assignment. His son was supposed to read the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. And he said that he had to help his son pronounce just about every other word in that chapter and that was a big problem so finally his son whenever he would explain what the word meant his son would ask him the question well dad if it means that why doesn't it just why didn't it just say that and he said from that moment that was somewhat of an, an epiphany uh, from that moment he decided that he was going to uh, not encourage his children anymore to have to labor with the King James and so now they're using the ESV well here's the problem brethren in all of the new Bibles, all of them, you're going to find words that are going to require explanation. Okay, this is super, super important. This is the linchpin of much of the rest of his argument. You get the easiest to read translation that, they, that they're promoting out in the market, and you're still going to find words that you're going to need a dictionary for. Okay? Uh, and then, I, I want to know this, in Luke 16, okay, the story about the rich man who went to hell. Well, the new King James changes the word hell to Hades. How, does, how is that easier to understand? Because how much you want to bet when his son comes to that word Hades in a story that's supposed to be talking about hell, he's going to ask his dad the question, what does that mean? And his dad's going to have to give him some type of an explanation. So the same question could be asked about the new King James, because he's going to have to say, well, you have to understand, Hades can mean hell. Well, Dad, if that's what it means, why doesn't it just say that? You can use the same argument for all of the different Bibles, okay? Let's look at a few more examples. Okay, we're going to go through those examples. I let him talk for quite a while here uh, to give you a more extended flavor of what his argument is. Let's remember back to when he said that the case that the King James is not sufficiently readable is exaggerated. Now, to say it's exaggerated is to acknowledge that there is something to it, and he does acknowledge this, as I showed. But, of course, he turns the tables. You heard him do it. He says that all translations, all modern translations, contain words that require explanation. And this becomes a theme for him. And it's rhetorically effective. I've got to hand it to him. And every once in a while, the King James only us almost get me with this argument. There is indeed some truth in it. But then my mind starts whirring and chugging and clanging, you know, the engine up there gets going, and I, I remember. They're refusing to do two all-important things. They're refusing to count, and they're refusing to categorize. Okay, so the number of readability, readability difficult, difficulties in the King James is exaggerated. Well, then how many are there? They never say. Uh, although, actually, in this... Uh, uh, conference, one guy actually comes out with a number, and I was totally shocked. We'll, we'll get there. Um, but at this point in the conference, he's not saying, okay, so they don't count. And what categories do these difficult words fall into? They never categorize them. We will notice something about the alleged difficulties in the New King James, the one that he's about to give. A great many of them are proper nouns. They're not difficult or obscure or archaic words so much as they are difficult or obscure or foreign things. No serious conservative, such as I take myself to be, is arguing that we should replace the word sheep in the Bible with an animal that tribes people in the Amazon are familiar with, you know, when we translate the Bible for them. A sheep is a difficult, obscure, or foreign thing to the Yanomami people of the Amazon that Jim Elliot died trying to reach. A word for sheep may have to be invented in their language. A footnote may have to accompany the word sheep every time it appears in their Bibles. Fine. If they don't have sheep, they will have to learn about sheep. But 
All cultures that I know of have brooms. I assume that even Inuit in the frozen north have brooms that they use in the summertime to sweep stuff. Everybody knows what a broom is, as far as I know. So why insist on calling it a besom, as the King James does, if people don't know that word? This is an entirely different category of difficult word. Again, it's, it's one thing to point out that in a very old book, like the Bible, the authors discuss foreign cities and coins like drachmas, denarii, you know, foreign rivers, Euphrates, whatever, and plants and rocks and animals. Because of this broad category of difficult things, accurate translation of the Bible will always and must always include some difficult words that you have to look up. I would call this kind of difficulty necessary. It's a difficulty God placed in scripture. But it's another thing to allow over time the category of archaic words in the translation to grow to a large size. Uh, archaic words in w for which there are well-known contemporary equivalents like besom and broom. This is my complaint about King James onlyism. This is an unnecessary difficulty that we pose to readers. Sure, if you lump all difficult words into one bucket, you can observe that the modern translations have full buckets just like the King James does. But if you separate the buckets, putting words for difficult things in one bucket and archaic words in another bucket, you'll see that modern versions, modern versions have few to no words in that second bucket in the archaic bucket. And I think if you count up the difficult words in the respective buckets of the King James and New King James. Even if you didn't categorize, if you just counted, I still think you'd see far more in the King James than in the New King James. I have seen this particular rhetorical strategy so, so many times among King James defenders. I confess I grow a little weary of pointing it out, but here I am saying it again. I was working through some of this material as I was taking the bus, going from Bellingham to Mount Vernon, Washington after work. Uh, as I was writing some thoughts down, we just, we, we drove past the stupendously beautiful opening to the mountains where Cedro Woolley, Washington is. I'm just doing my best to patiently instruct those who are in opposition. God help me. One more thought here, because this is so central to the debate in my mind. The argument here from Brother Ramirez makes no sense. If you really think about its implications, if you trace it out to its end, some difficult words that require explanation will always be in the Bible, he says, and that's true. So therefore, we shouldn't be bothered when difficult words occur in a translation that require explanation. But what if we can easily get rid of one of the buckets? What if by adopting a contemporary English translation, we can eliminate an entire category of difficulty and still be just as faithful to the text of the Hebrew and Greek? That would just free up more time for explaining the remaining difficulties, right? Latin words require explanation, so let's just stick with them. Let's use the Vulgate. You know, for that matter, Greek words require explanation, so do Hebrew and Aramaic ones. Might as well not bother to translate at all. We can just explain everything. Thank God Brother Ramirez does not say this. He doesn't take this argument to its logical end, but this is where his logic goes. He'll say that my logic goes the opposite direction, that if I had my way, the Bible would be dumbed down beyond recognition. And I think, though, that I have a principled answer here. Make the translation just as difficult, no more and no less, as the original was. If the Hebrew uses an archaic word, one that was archaic to the original speakers, using an archaic English one would be okay. If it doesn't, then let's remember that edification requires intelligibility. Let's go on. Uh, in Genesis 6, 4, it, talk, it says the, there were giants in the earth in those days. The ESV and all the other ones, they say the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Okay, well, here, what, which word do you think young people are going to recognize easier? The word giants or Nephilim? Now, I don't know what you believe about the Nephilim, but it kind of really doesn't matter. Whatever it is you believe about the Nephilim, it's going to require explanation. And whatever your explanation is of the Nephilim, if you believe, for example, like I do, but I wouldn't die on this hill, but uh, if you believe that the Nephilim is a reference to giants, like the King James Bible says, well, you're going to have to explain that to your children, and your children might ask the question, well, why doesn't the ESV just say that? Here's another one for you. Uh, okay, on the Nephilim. You know, we're getting into very familiar King James only territory. We've seen this with Albert Hemd in that other video. Ramirez is answering a matter before he hears it. He expresses no interest at all in asking why 
his brothers in Christ who translated the modern versions, men and women with more PhDs than you can legally shake a stick at in the state of California, why they made the choice that they did for Nephilim and not giants. He seems to think they were trying to make the Bible harder to read. I mean, I guess. Actually, the New King James does have the word giants here. It's other modern versions that use Nephilim. I actually actually do think that the word Nephilim is kind of a cop-out. I would stick with giants. But this is a word that's used only three times in the whole Hebrew Bible. And the King James translators themselves point out in their preface that there are some obscure Hebrew words whose meaning is uncertain. Nephilim is one of those words. The Greek Septuagint is where we get uh, the word meaning giants, gigantes, I think it is. And the parallel passage, uh, the parallel passages where this word is also used speak of them as very tall. So that view has a lot going for it. But modern versions who choose Nephilim don't do it to be harder. They do it to be accurate. They do it to acknowledge that actually we don't know exactly what this word means. And so we don't want to mislead you. Now, I actually do disagree with that choice. I don't think they need to reach for transliteration here. I'm actually with Ramirez and the King James and the New King James in the end, but I see why the NASB and the ESV and others do what they do here. Ramirez doesn't see why, and I see no evidence that he ever asked why. Uh, uh, In in the ESV, okay, in the ESV, uh, it talks about, uh, is there any taste in the juice of the mallow? What is that? I don't know. Job 6.6 in the NIV says the sap of the mallow. Uh, in the NASB, it says the juice of an alkanet uh, plant, okay? Well, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the King, King James Bible, it says in the white of an egg. Well, I know what the white of an egg is. What the juice of an alkanet plant is, I have no idea what planet that's from, okay? Uh, the same that I said after the last segment about Nephilim goes for the juice of the mallow versus the white of an egg. I was a little surprised that he expressed no curiosity as to why the modern translations differ from the King James here. He didn't ask. He didn't check. Yes, the white of an egg is easier to understand than the juice of the mallow. But even I, the king, or at least the third vice president of edification requires intelligibility, even I have never said and definitely do not believe that easy to understand is the main principle in Bible translation. No, accuracy, accurate translation, accurate conveying of the meaning, that's the main principle. I want to know what the Hebrew says. And here it simply is not clear. The main guesses are alkanet, which you heard him mention. That's a flowering plant that's used to make red dye. Uh, Mallow, a family of plants, and bugloss, another plant. Unless the King James translators were inspired, these other three options have to be considered for this very obscure verse, whose point is clear almost no matter which of the choices you go with. He's just talking about an insipid, tasteless substance. And let's remember that there be many rare names of certain birds, beasts, and precious stones, etc., (coughs) excuse me, concerning which the Hebrews themselves are so divided among themselves for judgment that they may seem to have defined this or that rather because they would say something than because they were sure of that which they said. You know who said all that? You know who I was quoting? That was the King James translators. Very serious and capable students of biblical Hebrew and related languages think that the option preferred by the King James is viable, the white of an egg. Equally serious students prefer a plant like mallow or alkanet. No translator worth his salt picks the easier-to-understand option just because it's easier. He must instead work hard and go with his best lights as to what the Spirit most likely intended. For what it's worth, in cases like this where a word is used very few times or only once, appealing to cognate languages is a very common practice. We go look to see what the is or the Arabic or other ancient languages that were related to Hebrew, the Aramaic. Go see what th- that root meant in their languages. Um, and I, th- I think that's what's going on here. It- it's just very difficult. But this is the situation that God gave us. It's going to require explanation. Which of these two words are, are children or young people, people in your congregation, going to recognize easier? The word pride or insolence? Well, don't you understand the word insolence means pride? Well, why doesn't it just say that in the ESV? On pride versus insolence, uh, that's Proverbs 13.10. I actually think I have to agree with Ramirez here. Upon initial inspection, 
and I did look into this just a little, and uh, without a footnote explaining this choice, it, it seems to me that insolence was an unnecessarily difficult word to choose. Pride would have been just fine, or maybe arrogance. The ESV is the only major English translation to use the word insolence that I could find, but it's a little funny that Ramirez chose this verse because over the years I've noticed repeatedly that I had trouble understanding the archaic syntax of the King James here. Listen to it. You know this phrase if you know the King James. Only by pride cometh contention. Does that mean that pride comes only through contention or that contention is the only result of pride? I always have to think twice. And honestly, this very minute, I'm not sure. Go ahead and tell me in the comments what the true answer is. You can go on, on, on and on with this. Uh, with this. Uh, in, in the ESV, it, it says rabble. The King James says youth. Which word do you think young people are going to recognize? Rabble or youth? Uh, here's an on rabble versus youth, this is a word that occurs only once in the Hebrew Bible. That means, like I said a minute ago, it is just really hard to know its meaning. Etymologically, if you go you know, look at the word's history or words it's related to, it appears to mean brood, like brood of vipers. Once again, a translator has to make a judgment call as to what is intended here, and there are a number of ways that translators go in, in all languages. It always surprises me that King James defenders express so little curiosity, that is none, as to why modern translations might differ from the King James at a given place. Another one, the ESV in Colossians 2.23 says asceticism. The King James Bible says humility. Which word are folks in a congregation going to recognize easier? The word asceticism or humility? Are you not going to have to Pick, get a dictionary or give some type of explanation to explain what asceticism is? But the King James Bible says humility. Now here's the thing. The point here is not to try to prove that all these other Bibles are easier to read than the King James. That's not really the issue. The, the point I'm trying to make here is this. If, if your argument is... I, I think he misspoke there. He's saying uh, the point here is not to deny, I think he was saying, uh, is not to prove that the... Oh boy, the way he said it. Yeah, basically, like he's acknowledging there, there are elements in the newer translations that are easier to read. That the Bible needs to have words that are simpler. You know, if that's what it means, then why doesn't it just say that? Well, two can play at that game. We can, we can use the same argument for any Bible on the market. Okay? Uh it's super ironic. It's, just think back just a minute. Uh, that Brother Ramirez picked Colossians 2.23. That's what's up on the screen there behind him, if you can see it, uh, as his example, because it's so incredibly difficult to the point of impossible in the King James, this verse. I don't say that about many King James verses, but this is the verse with which I opened my authorized documentary uh, because I found I found it to contain so many impenetrable phrases. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship, what's will, will worship, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. It's especially that last phrase that I literally cannot understand. I've tried, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. I honestly don't get it. That word humility that he brings up, there's a good reason the ESV went with asceticism. Basically, Paul uh, uses the same word here that he uses when he is praising humility, but he puts it here in Colossians 2.23 in a list of sins. So what's he doing? What can this mean? It has to mean something like self-abasement or asceticism. Other translations just go with false humility, but I like the ESV's solution better. It does appear to name what Paul was criticizing. Asceticism is not an easier word than humility, but in context, I think it is easier, though admittedly, you have to know what it means. But you can look it up, which is something I do not oppose. Look up humility, and I think you'll still be stumped, or at least challenged, which isn't necessarily bad. But what is this positive thing doing in a list of sins? That could be confusing. Again, this is not a terrible thing to happen. It, it might send you on a Bible study journey. It should, but I would not agree that humility is easier here than asceticism, given the context. And I just want to pause also in the midst of these discussions to point out something about counting and categorizing. He does show a number of places where the individual word used in, the, in a given modern version is on the surface of it, more difficult than the corresponding word in the King James. But I've never, ever, 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 ever seen a King James defender do the opposite. 
he just acknowledged a little bit that there, I, I think he did, that some, you know, there, there's something to the idea that modern versions are more or easier to read than the King James. So show us those places and then count them. <laughs> How many places are there where because of archaisms alone, just, just that category, the New King James or the ESV or the NAS or the NIV, how many places are there where, where those versions are easier to understand? Um, this is the very definition of one of those logical fallacies, I would think insufficient sampling, um, even if he's right. And I've actually acknowledged that he is on a couple of these examples. I have both given an explanation for why the modern translations have done what they've done. And I've challenged him. Okay, go back the other way, brother. This is a research council. Go research. How many false friends and dead words in the King James are causing people to misunderstand whether they know it or not? Count those up um, and then compare them to, in those instances, to the, the modern versions and see how they're doing. Uh, same with, we can go on and on. There's so many examples. I don't have the time. Psalm 86, 13. I love this verse. Great is thy mercy toward me and thou hast deli delivered my soul uh, from the lowest hell. Well, all the new Bibles, including the new King James says Sheol. How many young people are going to know what Sheol is? But how many young people are going to know what hell is? Okay. And so what, what he's saying about this Psalm is true, but it does leave out two utterly crucial things that I keep mentioning, counting and categorizing. How many difficult words are in the King James and how many of them are unnecessarily difficult? How many are difficult not because of the inherent difficulty or obscurity of the statement that God inspired in Hebrew or Greek, but because of archaic Elizabethan words and sentence structures that no longer communicate as clearly as they once did. You know, on Sheol versus Hell, we're dealing with precisely what we saw with the word Nephilim. When translators just do not know with confidence what a given word means in a given passage, one option they have is to transliterate those words instead of translating them. That's actually what's happened with the so, word uh, let's... Uh, baptism. Um, let me pause here again, sorry. Uh, the word baptism is, is not a translation, it's a transliteration. Because that transliteration has been used for so long, uh, it comes straight from the Greek word baptizo. You, you can hear the similarity there. They just took the Greek letters and turned them into English ones. But because it's been used for so long, it's now actually become an English word and we don't think twice about it. Those who believe it means dip, as I do, immerse, uh, continue to practice their practice and use baptism to mean that. Those who don't use it to mean something, something different. Um, this is an established category of option for Bible translators. Now, I think with the word Sheol, transliterating rather than translating is poor sport. I actually prefer the King James in this psalm passage, but I see why modern translations do what they do here. I did a paper in an Old Testament class on the word Sheol, and it was very difficult. It's used to name the grave, but also more than the grave. I'll give Ramirez a point here, but I'll take a little of it back by noting that, right or wrong, the motivation of modern translators here is to be accurate and not inaccurate. It's to not mislead readers. The King James translators are evenly split between grave and hell as translations of this Hebrew word shoal. And this makes for a few awkward phrases. Did David really say in Psalm 139, this, is this what he intended? If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Or did he intend to refer to the grave? It's difficult to know unless the King James translators had special fleece to put out each morning with translation options on them and God made the fleece dry and the ground wet to confirm their choices, we have at times to be willing to lean a different direction than they did. Move on. Uh, here's another one. Uh, uh, Brother uh, Brown was just telling you about how he lost his iPhone there in the, in, in the river up there in the mountains of Puerto Rico. Well, the New King James doesn't say rivers, it says rivulets. When's the last time you told your children, let's go fishing at the rivulet? What are you talking about? No, I'm talking about the little rivers. Well, why didn't you just say that? What? You know, we, we have to, I don't know why I just touched my nose. Uh, it's the international symbol for pulling ourselves out of the weeds, I guess. Let's, let's look at the big picture. There is simply no way that any fair-minded observer could possibly claim that the archaic English of the King James Version is easier to read than the NIV or ESV. This is not to deny that difficulties occur in the modern versions. 
It is to insist that there is something really wrong with a movement that manages to obfuscate such an obvious truth. But I will let him have this one. Rivulets is somewhat more difficult than Little Rivers. Fine. Because I used the new King James. Okay, uh, here's another good word. Uh, the King James says in Lamentations 5.3, the fatherless. The new King James calls the fatherless the waifs. I never even heard of that word until I started doing this study right here. Okay, as a matter of fact, I found out that the NIV says fatherless just like the King James. So here's a case where the NIV reads even easier than the new King James. That's interesting. This is uh, rather impolitic to point out, so I am burying it deep in this video. But for guys who go on and on about how the modern versions dumb down the Bible, I just find it funny how often they acknowledge that they don't know certain contemporary English words. This happened several times at the KJBRC conference. I knew all the words that they complained about, even the words overweening and mallow, and I know the word waif. I don't remember a time in my life when I did not know these words. I love words. I know words. I get complaints sometimes that my vocabulary in these videos is too demanding, like the word impolitic. I'll get some com complaints about that. 20 plus years of reading modern translations may have made me dumb in other ways, but it doesn't seem to have shrunk my vocabulary. Yes, waif is somewhat poetic or literary here. Is that so bad? But I will give Ramirez another point. The word waif is arguably more poetic than it has to be, more poetic than the Hebrew is, according to my individual judgment. And another point for him, I would not have used the word overweening. It was not used in the latest revision of the NIV. Uh, we can go on and on. Uh, here's another one that I found very odd. Uh, in the 1984 edition of the NIV in Isaiah 16, 6, it talks about her overweening pride. Overweening? What's that? I don't know, but whatever it is, it sounds painful. Don't do that. Okay? And in my room, by myself, mind you, I didn't have Christian parents. My dad was a, a lost alcoholic. My mother was a lost Catholic. Nobody told me I was supposed to do this. But Sister Camille said, read John chapter 3. I read John chapter 3 out of a King James Bible. And that night, by myself, just me and the Holy Ghost in my bedroom, I got on my knees before God and called on the Lord and begged him to save me. And he saved me that night. Through reading a King James Bible. And I was only 10 years old. Shortly after that, my mom and dad also got saved and they're in church today. Here's what I'm saying. Brethren, if the King James Bible was not too hard or too difficult for a little 10-year-old boy to read it and get saved by the grace of God, I am not buying this argument that the King James Bible is too hard for folks to read. He got a lot of amens out of that and that is a great story. But I don't buy his argument that because he understood the gospel from the King James when he was 10, and praise God he did, he is my brother, that that means that archaic words should be of no concern to us. I've never denied that I got tons out of the King James Version before I ever picked up a modern version. What I've denied is that anyone alive can get everything the King James translators tried to communicate not without the help of specialist tools like the massive, expensive, exhaustive Oxford English Dictionary. I've demonstrated this over and over again. These poor brothers don't deal in any detail with anything that I've said. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Okay? The King James Bible is not outdated. It's timeless. It's unique. Dr. Stringer deals with this uh, in his book, The Unbroken Bible. Go buy it after you buy all mine. Uh, Dr. Edward Hills. I got to move on, got to move on. Uh, the English of the King James Version, quote, by, uh, Dr. Edward Hill says, the English of the King James Version is not the English of the early 17th century. To be exact, it's not a type of English that was ever spoken anywhere. It is biblical English, which was not used on ordinary occasions, even by the translators who produced the King James Version. Even in their use of thee of, and thou, the translators were not following 17th century English usage, but biblical usage, for at the time these translators were doing their works, these singular forms had already been replaced by the plural you in polite conversations. So when folks tell you that uh, they don't like the King James because the wording in it is archaic, the word archaic is incorrect. 
That's not the right description, my brethren. The, the English of the King James Bible is not outdated English. The English of the King James Bible is a style of English that was never used by any man on the street in any era of time. It was strictly a literary style. Again, get Dr. Stringer's book, and he explains this in his book, but the English used in the King James Bible was strictly a literary style. Think about it. By the time the King James translators embarked upon their work in 1604, there were other good Bible, Texas Receptus-based English Bibles uh, available. Most folks were using the Geneva Bible for a good 50 years or so and were attached to it emotionally, okay? There was also the Tyndale translation, the lesser scale, the ones that the Catholic Church didn't get to and burn off, okay? But there were other Bibles. So when the King James translators came together, they said, we need to do something that will make our Bible unique because there are other good Bibles available. What's gonna set our Bible apart? Well, there are several things that sets it apart, but one of the things that sets the King James Bible apart is the style of English that it was used. It is not a style that anyone spoke in any era of time. It was strictly a literary style that presents elegance, okay? Sort of like the style that is used, was used in the Shakespearean plays. A.T. Robertson, who was not a King James only man, even he recognized this in his book, A Grammar of the Greek New Testament. He said, quote, no one today speaks the English of the authorized version or ever did for that, or, or ever did for that matter. For though like Shakespeare, it is the pure Anglo-Saxon, un, uh, yet unlike Shakespeare, it reproduces to a remarkable extent the spirit and language of the Bible. Okay, so it's inaccurate. Brethren, the King James Bible English is not archaic. It's timeless, okay? It's unique. The King James translators were not concerned with easiness. Their concern was accuracy and purity. Their goal was to honor the sacredness of God's holy words with the most majestic form of English available, which they accomplished, okay? Uh, I like what a missionary uh, said online. His name is Steve Donnelly, a missionary to the Yukon. He said, quote, we lift people up to the word, not lower the word down to them. This push to dumb down reading standards rather than raise the standard or at least maintain the standard is hurting our young people. It's not helping them. Oh, Dr. Jones continues to say. Okay, I let you hear a, a big chunk of his argument here. And I have to acknowledge I have not read Phil Stringer's book on this topic. I, I was not familiar with its existence. Uh, but neither have they listened to my video on Biblical English. And, uh, and actually, nothing that he just said about Biblical English is new to me. I, some of the quotes I hadn't actually heard. I heard the Hills quote. Uh, but, um, you know, of course, he had a quote from a missionary friend or something. I haven't heard that. But the, the arguments, you know, that it's timeless, that it's biblical English, those I've definitely heard and, and dealt with, and they didn't answer my arguments. You can go watch my video on biblical English. It's actually one of my earlier videos. Briefly, there is some truth in this, you know, argument that, about biblical English. The King James does tend to stick pretty literally close to the Hebrew and Greek, even with idioms and other figures of speech. You know, even with the frequent use of the word and at the beginning of clauses in, you know, the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament, uh, or even with what sounds in our English like unnecessary redundancies, like he answered and said, you know, we never say that, but the King James does because the Greek does. But here again, we're failing to categorize. The fact is that plenty of literal modern versions do this sort of thing too, producing what I call some Greeklish and there are all sorts of undeniable archaisms that you have to consider, too, in the King James. It just can't be an accident that over and over again in my 50 False Friends in the King James series, which is now up past 70 examples, with plenty more on the way, by the way, I look up words in the Oxford English Dictionary, and the relevant sense, the one that's used in the King James, is marked obsolete. I won't say that anyone in the world is entirely objective, but I will say that it strains credulity to think that enemies of the King James Bible have snuck into the Oxford English Dictionary offices and labeled some senses of certain English words as obsolete. Um, the whole idea of hey, biblical what has happened English... In the past? <clears throat> sorry about that. The whole idea of biblical English um, is, is uh, I, I think... I, I want to say the word dodge. Again, I just don't like to say that word as if this is purposeful. Um, but uh, let me say this. It does an end run around what you can't not know when you look up word after word after word 
in the King James and find that responsible lexicographers have marked them as archaic or obsolete. It just cannot be that this is timeless and that actually everybody who speaks anything called English should always be able to understand it if they're well-educated enough. No, language just doesn't work like that. There's no such thing as timeless English or timeless any language, timeless French, timeless Russian, all language, any language can be dated to a time and usually located in a place. That's why those New York Times, you know, uh, graphs that show where do people say soda, where do they say pop, that's why they can be so accurate in predicting where people are from. It's really pretty amazing. This is the way language works. There's no such thing as anything uh, as timeless or biblical English. Has been this ignorant, illiter illiterate people in this country and in foreign countries coming into salvation have been educated up to the book and have begun to understand it, to glory in it, and to praise God for it. I say that we need to do the same at this present time. What we need, therefore, is not to replace the authorized version. We need rather what we need to do rather is to reach and train people up to the standard and language, the dignity, and the glory of the old authorized version. He's actually quoting David Martin Lloyd-Jones there, and you know it's a little funny to be hearing an independent fundamental Baptist, those who typically really hate Calvinism, uh, quoting one of the leading Calvinists of the 20th century. But you know where they can find agreement, um, you know we all tend to do this sort of thing. But I I reject this argument from two directions. First, I'm not at all sure that exclusive use of the King James version has produced a bunch of excellent prose stylists, people who know English really, really well. Theodore Letus was a King James defender of a different stripe than the IFB who could write excellent, vivacious sentences, who could turn a phrase that made me chuckle despite my disagreement with them. And if you want to count Doug Wilson as a King James defender, obviously that man can write like nobody's business is afloat any longer. But I don't think the King James Bible Research Council really wants to claim Letus and Wilson. They're not on the same page. And much more importantly, I reject this argument from the other direction. I love the plowboy. I spent a lot of years serving the below average Joe in ministry. And Jesus had some very stiff words for anyone who put a stumbling block in the way of those little ones. I will never, ever forget the sheer bewilderment of old Thelma Jackson, who just died a few weeks ago as I record this, when she brought me, her pastor, a self-pronouncing King James Version, one of those editions with all the syllables broken up uh, in proper nouns, Maharshalel, Hashbaz, Jerusalem, even Jesus. She just could not make head or tail of it. I got her a new international reader's version and Bible reading improved dramatically in that ministry as I got one for everybody. Also, I've put thousands of hours into teaching King James readers how to fish for false friends. I don't at all deny that I hope these brothers and sisters will pick up other versions alongside their King James, nor do I deny that I hope pastors will no longer use the King James in their pulpits. I've said that openly. But I do affirm and avow that I have done far, far more work teaching people how to understand difficult King James words than any King James, King James onlyist ever has. I teach principles. Uh, I don't just give people a fish, I teach them how to fish. Because what I really value is not using this translation or that one. It's not having God's word per se. It's understanding God's word. I'll do respect to David Martin Lloyd-Jones. I simply disagree. I don't think this is the biblical teaching. I don't think that we need to teach people a different kind of English and older English in order to give them access. I don't think we should have to do this in order to give them access to God's words. I think that they ought to be able to have God's words in their own English. By the way, brethren, who said the Bible was supposed to be easier to read anyways? The Bible is the word of God, not man. Isaiah 55, says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Brethren, shouldn't the Bible of all books raise the standard higher than any other book out there? Okay. Uh, some things in the Bible require study. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Some things require guidance. Okay. Uh, by this principle, uh, again, why not just stick with Hebrew and Greek? Let's raise people up to that level instead of dumbing down the Bible by putting it into English at all. And irony of ironies, if you know my work, I have to hand it to Brother Ramirez. He made it pretty far into his address before he himself got tripped up by a false friend in King James English. But he finally did at that most ironic of places, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study here, study to show thyself approved, did not mean hit the books in 1611 English. 
The Greek word underlying it did not mean that. The English word in 1611 in a context like this one did not mean that. To find out what it did mean, you'll have to watch my videos on study. I've got two of them. What a sad, sad irony. Oh, my brothers, you are the dwarfs in the vestibule of Aslan's kingdom, tasting the NIV that Aslan hands to you and spitting it out, calling it poison. Like the Ethiopian eunuch when he went to Philip and said, Unders uh, Philip asked him, understandest thou what thou readest? He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? This is why God calls pastors to help folks, to guide them in all truth. That's why they're to be apt to teach. Pastors are failing their people by recommending watered down, corrupted Bible versions. That's bad leadership. You know, yeah, I, I've heard this all the time from the very beginning of my work. I, I don't know a single King James only pastor. Uh, you know, that's not quite true. I know a couple who have said that they do this kind of work. I have no direct evidence that any King James only pastors are doing anything, doing anything like the kind of work that I have done to teach people how to read the King James Version. But actually, I want to talk uh, about this argument from Acts, um, where he talked about the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, needing to have something explained to him. I had this same argument posed to me by a very dear brother, Armin Tomasian, who is not King James only per se. He's a he's the pastor of Faith Free Presbyterian Church in Greenville, South Carolina. I have a great love and respect for this brother. We had a two-hour conversation late at night after I gave a lecture at Bob Jones a, a little over a year ago, as I record. During the Q&A, he mentioned this passage, the Ethiopian eunuch, and I stumbled over my words in front of everybody enough that more than one friend, including one of my old professors, Ken Casillas, contacted me and reminded me nicely of what I should have said. It's really doubtful that the Ethiopian eunuch was saying, I don't know these difficult words. He here are those words. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. No, what the Ethiopian eunuch needed help understanding was not the words or sentences, not archaisms or obscure words, not in and of themselves. He, he, want, he needed to know to whom these words referred. I know this because that's what he asked. He did not say to Philip, I don't quite get this. This Hebrew is hard to understand. He asked, and the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? In more technical terms, linguistic terms, he understood the sense of what he read, but not the reference. This will always be needed. I still need the help of teachers to help me understand scripture. Christ gave teachers to his church, Ephesians 4 says, but it doesn't follow that we should give people extra difficult translations on purpose, not when lay Bible reading is such an important practice. I think this is a category confusion. Some things in the Bible require spiritual discernment. Guess what? Some things in the Bible you're never going to get until God gives it to you. The Bible talks about spiritual discernment. The natural man receiving not the things of the Spirit of God uh, because they're spiritually discerned. Ephesians 1.18 talks about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Okay, uh, Psalm 119.18, the psalmist prayed, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of the law. There are things in the Bible, no matter what, how easier you try to make it, there are some things that God's going to have to open your eyes to those truths. There is a one that's calling for... My wife, I think it was, said something about this to me when she heard this same argument, which I've gotten many times from a King James Onlyist. She said, how discouraging this would be to people who know they struggle to understand the King James. It's kind of like the Pentecostals telling people they're sick because they don't have enough faith that God will heal them. So if I were truly walking with the Spirit, I would know the word chambering, or I would have realized that how long halt ye between two opinions didn't mean how long stop ye between two opinions, like I always assumed. Again, this is a failure to categorize. He talks as if, because there are some truths in Scripture that are understandable, ultimately, uh, are only able to be accepted, ultimately, only by the help of the Spirit of the God, Spirit of God, that, that we should therefore permit other kinds of difficulty to remain, unnecessary difficulties that are due to language change, and that could be easily fixed with a revision. He's again mixing everything into one bucket instead of separating them, categorizing. This is confusion, but I hear it all the time. Michelangelo's artwork in the Sistine Chapel to be changed with a watered-down version of, of his work, uh, because that would demonstrate a lack of appreciation for the brilliance of his accomplishment. 
nor is anyone calling for a watered-down version of the Mona Lisa or any other masterpiece. Brethren, the King James Bible is a brilliant masterpiece. So is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel a true parallel to the situation we have with the King James? Perhaps it is, in a way, but not in the way Brother Ramirez saw. That ceiling has had so many tourists come see it over the centuries, some of them smokers, all of them breathers, that it has had to be professionally cleaned. This doesn't have to happen every year, but the passage of time means that periodically it does have to occur, lest the beauty of the original be obscured. Huh, sounds like a good thing to do to the King James. Of course, paintings are not truly analogous to translations. Art is a nonverbal form of communication. Dr. Henry Morris, he was asked to be a part of the committee for the New King James Version to, oversee, to, to, to proofread the book of Genesis in the New King James. And even having done that, even he uh, admitted this, quote, this is Dr. Henry Morris, president and founder of the Institute of Creation Research. Really smart guy, right? Okay, he says, quote, the beautiful prose of the King James Version is a treasure which should not be lost. It has been acclaimed widely as the greatest example of English literature ever written, apart from a few archaic words which can be easily clarified in footnotes. It is as easy to understand today as it was 400 years ago. This is why the common people today still use it and love it. It is the intelligentsia who tend to favor modern versions. He hey, there's a movie. Okay, sorry, I went a little bit too far there. That, that's the last clip that I'm going to show from Brother Ramirez. Obviously, we're going to move to somebody else. I'm going to repeat my main charge. Brother Ramirez fails to categorize, and he fails to count. He doesn't distinguish difficult words from archaic words. He doesn't distinguish obscure proper nouns, obscure things from archaic words. That's poor categorization. But he also fails to count. He says, following Henry Morris, that there are just a few archaic words that can be easily clarified with footnotes. I deny this, and I refute it thus. I make dozens of obsessively nerdy videos about false friends in the King James, words you don't know you don't know. Dozens of videos that the King James Bible Research Council has failed to research. Or have they? This next presenter that I'm going to show clearly has read or watched some of my content. Let's go over what he says about King James readability. I believe his name is Jared Longsign. ...to remove the venerable King James Bible, and by the way, our Bible's without error, and throw it out with the bathwater. And why? Because they see that the bathwater is dirty or they perceive it to be dirty. As we look it out... Okay, this is not quite about readability. I acknowledge this, but I just couldn't let it pass. Did you, did you hear what he said? The King James is without error. Now, if it's without error, it's inspired. And you know who argued this? The King James translators. There is no cause, therefore, why the word translated should be denied to be the word or forbidden to be current, that is, circulated, notwithstanding that some imperfections and blemishes may be noted in the setting forth of it. For we ask, whatever was perfect under the sun, where apostles or apostolic men, that is, men endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit and privileged with the privilege of infallibility, had not their hand. In other words, there is nothing that's perfect under the sun that wasn't inspired. To say that the King James is perfect is to say that in ambiguous cases where the Greek could go either way and where indeed the King James translators pointed this out in a marginal note, that in those cases the spirit nudged them in the right direction each time. The Spirit, in other words, clarified what he really meant, but only in English and only in 1611. That's additional revelation. When you call the King James perfect, you add to Scripture, and you stand against the King James translators. We, we see that the common <clears throat> criticism for this book today is that the words are archaic and obsolete. The words are archaic and obsolete. And since those words are archaic and obsolete, then the entire Bible should be replaced by a new English translation. Um, there's some of the equivocation that I've talked about in my practical, or my, my 10 ways to avoid Ruckmanism video, where he talks as if I'm saying the entire Bible should be replaced. No, the Bible is in Hebrew and Greek. I'm not replacing it. I'm revising a translation of it that's very different. 
But what he says in, in, in repeating that phrase, archaic and obsolete, you know, that, yes, that is my charge. There are a sufficient number of archaic and obsolete words and pieces of syntax, only by pride cometh contention, in the King James for me to call for revision. But he's quoting me here, I, I have good reason to believe, because he says a fair number of other things that are clearly directed at me, but which you'll have to go see for yourself because I won't defend myself here. And if he's quoting me as saying that lots of senses in the King James are archaic and obsolete, let's remember in turn who I am quoting. I'm quoting the dictionary. We are told repeatedly by these brothers that all you have to do to read the King James is pull out your dictionary, even the one on your phone. But remember, it's the dictionary that's telling me the words are archaic and obsolete. Many of them will say that they have a fondness for the King James Bible or that they grew up with it and had no problems until they became enlightened. Until they had the scales fall from their eyes and they realized the archaic and obsolete words were too much to overcome. How many words are there that are archaic and obsolete? To use the vernacular of one of the critics, how many false friends are there. If the English language has become so different that a new translation is needed, maybe they are on to something. Let us look at the numbers for one moment. Someone ex Okay, now I'm like really getting excited when I'm hearing this for the first time when I watched it, uh, you know, about two weeks ago. It's taken me about two weeks in my free time to put all these clips together and get my thoughts together. Let, let's hear it. He's definitely talking about me and he says he's about to count in the words that were being referred to as the false friends. And out of 788,137 words that are in the King James Bible, 788,137, that's a lot of words, 353 of them had definitions that were deemed to be false friends. That means 0.04 5% of all words are arguably difficult to understand. As a note, I went through the hassle of going through all those words. They weren't all that difficult to understand. If here th It's been five years since my book Authorized came out. It's been three years since I started posting my 50 False Friends in the King James series on YouTube, which is up to 70 or so. And this is the first time any King James only institution has made public acknowledgement of the existence of false friends in the King James. But here's the surprising thing to me. They cannot bring themselves to name a specific false friend that they did not know before I taught it to them. As we'll see in the next address, these brothers feel they have to reject my false friends with a blanket statement, even while acknowledging that false friends exist, as he just did. But still, we're getting somewhere. My main criticism of Brother Ramirez's presentation in the previous video was that he failed to categorize and count. This brother actually validates the category of false friends. He is categorizing and he counts, he presents a number. Now, I have no idea where he got this number, but and he says he got it from somebody else, he doesn't say who, but he admits to the existence of 353 false friends, 353 words in the King James that modern readers will not realize their misunderstanding unless they have some kind of help, a footnote, a word list, a commentary, what are these words? Where is this list? If I were King James only, I would want to know right away 353 words in my Bible that I don't, I'm going to read past. I'm not going to realize I'm misunderstanding. But neither this brother nor any other at the conference ever defines these words or ever explains or even mentions even one of them. He says they're all easy to understand. I say not. He says there are, 300, there are 353. I say there are well over 2,000 and I'm still counting. But we can't have a real debate if he won't get more concrete, if he won't talk about at least a few specific false friends and put on a paper on the website all the rest of them. He has to tell me which ones he accepts as false friends and which ones he thinks people should be able to understand today, which ones I'm wrong about. He has to make arguments, not sweeping dismissals, or he's not part of a research council. Brother Ramirez showed he was capable of talking about specific concrete King James words. But these brothers, in my experience, never talk about my specific false friends. I just have to encourage these brothers. Engage. 
listen to me. You are a research council for next year's conference. I challenge you to have seven of your guys examine 10 each of my false friends and tally up the number that you think are legitimate and the number you think are not. Look things up in dictionaries, Hebrew, Greek, and English. Make notes, make arguments, do some surveys to see if my predictions about King James readers are right. I'm doing a survey, will you? At the very least, have one guy evaluate five false friends. Please be specific, be concrete. She thinks she understands it, but in the end does not. We're talking a minuscule amount of false friends, quote unquote. You would not dispose of a valuable car because of 0.045% of potential misunderstanding. You would not throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's also... Okay, minuscule... Okay, how many? Which ones are they? How much baby is there in the King James and how much bathwater? All importantly, the question I never can seem to get a clear answer to is, under what linguistic circumstances would you support a King James revision? Okay, not at 0.0045%, whatever, fine. What percentage? How far does English have to move away from Elizabethan English before its time? How would you know? I've got a specific answer. You'd know because a number of dead words and false friends have stacked up. How many would there have to be before it's time for revision? That is, I confess, harder to answer. I just think we're clearly there. Practical. I'm thankful for the these and the thous. I know if something is in singular. I know if something is in plural at any given time. It's a... Our language... So this brother knows when a second person pronoun is singular or plural because of the way Elizabethan English does its pronouns. I've got a video about this too. I've actually got kind of more than one. I'm going to tease viewers by saying that I am confident that King James only pastors do not know that Y pronouns are plural, you know, ye, you, yours, and T pronouns are singular, thee, thou, thy. And I intend to prove it. And if the pastors don't know, I strongly suspect that their people don't know either. I'm not taunting. I am telling a simple and straightforward truth. And I will put up Today, a shut Today, no longer sores. Give... I'm... Sorry, I'm, I, I, I will try to give proof. Wings like eagles. More and more, it simply limps along in our pedestrian prose or is positively butchered in our text messages. As educators, we are charged with introducing students to something better. As pastors, as missionaries, as leaders in the church, we should be giving our people better than something pancake flat. I'm tired. Boy, am I tired. I'm staying up really late to do this. This is a really, really big project. Why did I take all this on? Uh, It's kind of funny. My mind wandered for a minute when I first watched this sermon or listened or both. And I actually missed his indication that he was quoting someone. But it suddenly hit me as he spoke. He did not write this. I'm an editor. I learned people's writing voice. This was not him. Let me ask, do you associate capacity to produce literary beauty with King James onlyism? Does exclusive use of the King James actually produce people who write well in, in, in English? I'll leave that for you to answer in the comments. I will only add two brief things. There are many, many excellent writers in contemporary English. As I said in Authorized, can someone really tell me that C.S. Lewis wrote debased and degraded English? He clearly didn't write Elizabethan English. He wrote modern English. Will someone in that case please infect my English with whatever disease C.S. Lewis's English had? Second, I, I just hate having to boast like this, but I did rather well in English class as a kid and on the verbal section of the SATs and in spelling bees. I was and am a reader like my old pa. And yet, nearly all of my King James false friends on my list of 70 plus so far were words that tripped me up. I did not understand them until I gained tools that are generally forbidden in King James only circles. And what I'm talking about is extensive study of Hebrew and Greek and the use of contemporary translations. Will they like it at first? Will they understand it at first? Maybe not. But we cannot be uplifted by something that is not above us. And does it take a little bit to get the cadence down? Yes. Now, I was a little older when I got saved. But my four-year-old son, when, and, and, I mean, I know he's brilliant. He takes after his mother. But he's been reading the King James since he was four. Reading it with articulation from a very young age. All my children have been able to read from the King James. 
with articulate fashion. And is it because they're all geniuses? I know every parent thinks their kids are geniuses, but if you introduce it to them young, they get this. So his four-year-old can read the King James just fine. <clears throat> if I had a four-year-old, for every time I've heard this, I would have not just a daycare, but a whole preschool with multiple teachers. And there is some truth in it. If you start kids young, a lot of them will pick up on a lot of King James language. They will code switch, it's called. I was such an one, but I still hit a wall. I understood the King James well as a kid, but not as well as I thought I did, and not as well as I would have understood the ESV or NIV if those had been given to me because of all the things that I go on and on about in my false friends videos. Brothers out there who insist that your rural congregations never complain about the King James or that your kids understand it just fine, <clears throat> have me come and test you all or have me send you a test to use. I have one ready. I will happily do it. They so are there words you need to think about in your King James Bible? The answer is yes. Yes. If you're reading any book for edification, there should be one or two words on each page that make you go, I don't understand this. You don't want to be reading kids' books forever. You want to graduate to the next level. Should the King James be updated? Is the Okay, this is Dan Haefeli. We're going to get to him in a second. Last comment from Brother Jared Longsign. I believe that's his name. Any book you read should have words you don't understand, he said. You know, maybe. I do have one essayist I like to read every so often who is probably the one contemporary writer who most consistently makes me pull out a dictionary at least a time or two in uh, most of his essays. It does seem that many portions of the Bible are going to be this way for most people, no matter what translation they read it in. The NIV makes Micah easier for me to read, for example, but it doesn't make it cake because uh, I have the same problem that the, you know, uh, titles. The e Sorry, I have the same problem that the Ethiopian eunuch had, right? I can understand the sense of the sentences, but sometimes I don't know what they're referring to, you know, the, the places or events that they refer to. I have to go, you know, remind myself in a study Bible or commentary or something. But what about extra difficulties from archaisms that are easily solved with an update? And what about words you don't know you don't know? What if there are three words on the page that you don't realize your misunderstanding in the King James? What are you supposed to do then? That is the situation I am saying has come about because of language change. Okay, now to this brother Dan Hayfley. Check out the title he was given. I am excited. What they gave me to speak on is somebody else's fault. I didn't choose this. The things that I say in... You know, I, I skipped over it by accident there. It is the readability of the King James Version that he's supposed to talk about. Anything I say, I don't want sound bites taken. I don't want people to think that I'm not 100% uh, King James. One of the reasons why we're afraid. Um, this is so interesting. The, the King James you know, Research Council is finally directly raising the issue I've been working on for all these years. And Brother Hayfley feels like he's got to give a disclaimer, insisting that what he's about to say in no way makes him anything other than 100% King James. What is he going to say? Let's find out. Of updating the King James Bible. Uh, there's, there's several, but one of the reasons is we're, we're afraid of dumbing down the language, dumbing down the text, losing something important. I don't think dumbing down the text is a reasonable fear. It is not what has actually happened when serious evangelical scholars have produced the New King James and ESV and NASB at least. But losing something important, I, I do understand why he fears that. This is always true when it's time for one tradition to die and another to take its office. But he has to ask himself not just what he could lose, but what he could gain with an update. And I actually think some of the things he's about to say are going to demonstrate that for him. Nobody in my church has a house phone, unless they're over 90. He's talking about the way culture has changed. The culture has entirely changed. We need to understand that when we're dealing with this issue. There are things, there, are, there is language that my kids grew up, I grew up understanding. I'm going to tell you something. There are people out there in our culture that do not get it at all. They don't get it. They need some help. They need somebody to guide them, but let's be, un let's be honest. 
we need to be careful about saying, well, everybody can read this. Everybody, well, your four-year-old can understand it. My four-year-old, I don't have any four-year-olds, my four-year-old can understand it too because they grew up on it and they're used to the language. But you understand the masses that are out there don't even know. Let me give you an illustration. God opened up uh, our ministry a little bit this year, kind of blew us away. We bought a nursing home to put a school in it. We've renovated the nursing home. We have a school in it. Kids are coming in from the public school. It's a big deal in our town. It's caused a little bit of stir. I won't bore you with all the details. I'll just say this. It's been a miracle, and it's just been amazing what's happened. Kids have come into our school my oldest son is the principal of our school, and he was having a Bible class, and he had the Bible class together, ninth grade girls sitting there, and she is, her grandparents go to church, her parents do not, she's been raised in, in school, um, in, in a public school, she comes and she's sitting there, and he says, okay, so this is your textbook, he said, I want you to do this with your textbook in your Bible, afterwards she comes up and she said, Mr. Ryan, she said, which one's my Bible? Which one's my Bible? Ninth grader. I don't know if you guys are noticing this. But my wife was trying, uh, okay. My wife was trying to teach the Ten Commandments the other day. Fifth grade girls class. And he's talking about thou shalt not covet. And I'm just, I'm not going to say it because that, but you guys can fi- figure it out. Thou shalt not covet a certain thing and that certain animal has a different connotation in our culture and those fifth grade girls thought it meant the other thing and they're like, why would you covet that? They think of that as your neighbors. Why would you covet that? They completely did not get it. Now, it didn't take long to explain it but after much laughter and embarrassing comments What I'm saying is, let's think about this. Not everyone that is leaving the King James is leaving it because they're rebellious. Not everyone that's leaving the King James and choosing other versions are leaving it because they're against God. Some of them are doing it because they don't understand some of the basic things we understand. And they think it's a second-tier issue. They would be wrong, but that's what they think. It was still King James. I am nothing short of thrilled to hear Brother Dan Hafley, I think his name is, say these things. I don't think he is 100% King James. He's at least dropped down to 98% just by saying all this. I've always wondered when the evangelistic zeal of the King James-only world, something that I honor and appreciate, will lead them to realize that non-Christians who didn't grow up with the King James really do struggle to understand the language. Now, in that example that he gave from his wife, of course, he was talking about the word ass. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ass. And notice, even he couldn't bring himself to say that word in mixed company. Why? Because its meaning in a sentence like that one has changed over time. It's simply not true that that certain animal has a different connotation in our culture. That almost makes it sound like the culture is at fault. It's like he's saying English speakers should not have taken that Bible word and turned it into an off-color word for buttocks. But that's just not the way language works. Actually, our word ass did not develop from the older word for donkey. It developed, and now I feel awkward because I decidedly do not like saying these words, it developed from ars, A-R-S-E, which actually traces all the way back to the Greek word oros. You can kind of hear the similarity, and that meant backside. It probably goes back further than that to Proto-Indo-European. It was an accident of the evolution of sound that turned oros into ass in English and displaced the unrelated word for donkey. That word ass came from the Latin word asinus, their word for donkey. Anyway, I'll say what brother, poor brother Hayfley struggled to actually say out loud. Would it be so bad if we updated ass to the correct translation for today, donkey? No, it would not be bad. It is not the fifth grade girl's fault that ass in that context no longer means donkey. 
If the Bible were being translated into English for the first time today, there's simply no way a translator would resurrect the old word for donkey at the risk of making fifth grade girls burst out laughing in the middle of Sunday school because it sure sounds like their teacher just told them that God's 10th rule is that girls are not allowed to see an attractive woman's rear end and wish that they were shaped like that too. You can say we just have to educate people up to the standard of the King James Version, but why then did Brother Hayfley struggle to say the word in front of a bunch of King James defenders? He wasn't talking to fifth grade girls. He struggled because he knows English as it is spoken now. I feel awkward for the same reason. And note what he said at the end of that clip. Not everyone who's leaving the King James is doing it out of rebellion against God. What? This is precisely what the rest of the conference has always been dedicated to proving. That if people like me had God's spirit, we would know the archaic words of the King James. That people like me are turning to corrupt Bibles because we don't like what the King James says and we want a Bible that tells us all the things that we want to hear. It was not enough changes. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've looked at some of the changes that they're suggesting, like Mark Ward and some of the others, some of the things he's saying I don't think are valid. I think Manny pointed out some of that yesterday, changing into some of these bigger words, more collegiate words is a mistake. But there are some words that I wish were updated. I, there's one particularly that, that I struggle with. It's First Thessalonians 4. He said, it would not prevent them which are asleep. That word prevent is an old English word. And every time I do a funeral, I have to stop and give them a King James Bible lesson to help them understand what it means. And I've stopped doing that. And I've just shall not precede them which goes which are asleep is what I just say it it's the same word means the same thing but our our language understands it I there are so few of those changes to be done that the question comes is it even worth it okay as somebody said yesterday just use a dictionary this is a little unclear because he appears to represent me you know he just named me he appears to represent me as recommending that we change to bigger, more collegiate words. Perhaps he wasn't talking about me at that moment because I don't believe this. I just want besom to be broom. I want chambering to be immorality. I want halt to be limp. You know the passages I'm talking about if you know my work. I want to use accurate contemporary English, just like Brother Hayfley does when he changes prevent to proceed. There are so few of these changes, he says. And I just want to ask, can you count how many? And how many would it take before a revision would be warranted? I ask the question again, and I ask this question again. How are you supposed to just use a dictionary to look up words that you don't realize you're misunderstanding because of language change? That, yet again, is what false friends are, as I apparently never tire of saying. Okay, that's possible. My question is, that works for us. Does that work for our culture? Is there a generation that is the greatest generation we call in America, World War II? That's the greatest generation. Is it time to think about spelling? Is it time to think about it again? Is it time to think about those things? I don't know. That's, that's your question. That's, that's up to you. Is it time to think about the spelling in the King James? Sure. At the very least, start there. Spelling is an aspect of intelligibility. When you use spellings that are not common or uh, utterly not used in a given uh, culture, I shouldn't say culture, in a given language, uh, because English now as it's spelled does not spell things the way the King James does in all places, and the King James has already gone through a spelling update, um, that does affect intelligibility. So yes, great, start there. Whatever can be done, to make the King James more intelligible to contemporary English speakers, according to the teaching of 1 Corinthians 14, I think is worth doing. Here's what I found. Now all of a sudden we're coming to a point where this generation doesn't relate to the World War II generation, doesn't relate to the 1900s, the early 1900s. It's almost like they don't know God, they don't know who God is, and they're coming up and they're finding God and they're saying, how come, how come 250 years now, how come we don't get a Bible in our vernacular. Everybody else did. How, can, how, can we, how come we don't? That's what they're saying. So what do you answer to that? I'm just telling you what I'm hearing. 
should we get a new translation? Have I already stated my position? Absolutely not. So along comes... It feels to me like Brother Hayfley at some level feels the pull of my viewpoint. I will take this as a win, even though he ends this segment with absolutely not. I still think we're getting somewhere. He grasps my central concern. Simplified KJV. I started reading it. I'm like, you know, here's me. Critique, I'm going to find the issues. I'm writing a book on this. I'm reading through this and I'm finding, okay. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, this is what we've been hollering about. I found some problems. They changed things like, they changed, and this is critical to me, they changed um, the seed of the woman in Genesis. They changed it to offspring. So they updated the language, and they should not have updated. Anytime, if anybody does any updates of the King James, this is something that's got to be careful, and it's got to be done with everybody with their hands in it. Because no, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. It, it has to be King James guys that'll smell a rat have to be involved in it. I do see a double standard here, but I also see some wisdom for anyone like me who would like to see a King James update achieve widespread adoption. Here's the double standard. The reasonable revision from seed to offspring is enough for him, it appears, to reject the entire simplified King James version. But 353 false friends in the King James, or I think more like 2,800 or something, are no reason for concern. But hear him. These brothers are fearful and not without some reason. They are distrustful of Christian scholars who have tried to produce King James updates. I think they have less justification for this distrust, but it's there for sure. How can trust be built? I think he nailed one aspect. I would love to see pro-King James organizations such as the KJBRC and the Trinitarian Bible Society get together and invest in a King James revision. If my touching it makes it untrustworthy, I can help silently or not at all. But I'd just love to see them do it. I would pray for them at the very least. Every time I've seen something that looked like it might work you know, it might be close. And some of the things he did here was really good. Capitalized pronouns. He updated things that I didn't even think about before. It was like quotation marks. He added quotation marks and updated grammar type things without changing the text. But there's a lot of mistakes in here. A lot of problems. Every time someone comes up with one of these, I look at it honestly. Because I believe an updated edition is not sin if it stays the same. It has to stay the same. The text has to stay the same. But updating, updating sentence, you know, like quotation marks or capitalization that's right, that matches, it's supposed to be. But every time they disappoint me. Every time. So at the end of the day, you, you, have, to come up with a, you have to come up with a position that, once again, the King James Version has proven itself. I didn't pick the King James Bible. I didn't pick it. It's proven itself that it is the Word of God and that God's stamp of approval on it. It is the one that's free. It is the one that's open. It is the one that's used by all of the church worldwide. And every time this is done, it doesn't work. I'm actually shocked in a good way to see the conference's comments on readability and hear on this high note. Now, I see no doctrinal reason why the text has to stay the same. That is, the translation decisions of the King James translators have to be retained in an update. If the King James translators did not think that their work was perfect, and if the Bible doesn't tell us to expect perfect Bible translations, and if we learn that actually the word that we thought hundreds of years ago meant the white of an egg now means mallow, it should be okay for the New King James translators to make minor adjustments to the interpretation that the King James translators chose in various places. But I see great practical reasons to do just as Brother Hayfley has suggested and update only the English. This is harder than it sounds, but it is doable. And I urge the King James Bible Research Council, again, to get together with the Trinitarian Bible Society and King James Only Bible Colleges and Crent. Kent Brandenburg and Dave Malinak and numbers of other people that I could name, Joe Shakur, 
and do it. The King James Version still has widespread trust, and its translation decisions are reasonable, even on those rare occasions when I disagree. So stick with its decisions, fine. But update the dead words and false friends. I will help. I'll do whatever I can. As Brother Hayfley says, an update would not necessarily be wrong. Now, I spent a lot of time in this video. It's one of the more difficult ones that I've ever made. I had to sit through the entire conference during a very busy life. I actually did a lot of the work during family TV time with one earbud in. A big reason that I did this, skimming through all those videos and pulling out clips, was that I wanted to earn the opportunity to give Brother Dan Hayfley some kudos and some encouragement. Do I actually believe that these brothers at the King James Bible Research Council will ever throw their weight behind a King James update when they just said that the King James is perfect? Do I believe this is even possible? Yes, I do. This is the most movement I've ever seen from these brothers on readability. They acknowledged the existence of false friends. They acknowledged that some words in the King James make fifth grade girls titter. They acknowledged that a King James update would not necessarily be wrong. They acknowledge that spelling updates okay or would be okay. They acknowledge that non-Christians have effectively zero familiarity with King James English, the, the, the distinctives of it. <clears throat> they repeated the words archaic and obsolete out loud. They said it's okay to change prevent to proceed. This is all major, major progress. Praise God, these brothers are coming along.